breeding superworms, breeding dubia roaches, mealworm farms, superworm farms, which live food is the best to breed for you. So we're gonna go through this on loads of different topics, break them all down. We're gonna go from five down to one so we can find out which is the best live food to breed. It covers loads of different things, how much time they actually take to breed, how long it takes them to breed, how, the, how much the setups cost, absolutely everything. Loads of little details in this video right now. Let's go. Number five on the list is sun beetles, sun beetle grubs, fruit larva. That sort of stuff is absolutely amazing. It's high in calcium, it's high in proteins, it's high in moisture content. So that's great for your bigger species like your savannah monitors. I breed fruit beetle grubs in this little container just here. This is a tropical factory UK enclosure and it was to be fair given to me. So you can pretty much use any enclosure that you physically want to. Uh, all you need to do is make sure you've got a deep substrate and that's where the babies are going to live, that's where the babies are going to grow up. That needs to have an awful lot of rotten wood matter inside it because that's what they eat you can add leaf litter and mix that all up into it that's perfectly fine you need to have some surface area because these beetles actually fly they sound amazing when they fly it sounds like a helicopter hovering <laughs> if you've never seen one uh there you go there's one just there. They're absolutely amazing. They're bright, they're colourful, they're great if you want to do it with the kids. And all you do is get your larva, which is your fruit beetle grubs. You pick them up in the reptile shop, they're sold as reptile food. You can get 10 for about £2 and you just chuck them into the substrate layers. That's it. Eventually, over around about a month or so, if they, if you've got them full size anyway, they'll turn into a cocoon. And around about a month, maybe two months after that, they'll turn into the beetles. Two weeks after that, they will start being sexually mature and start mating. You will then start to see the eggs going into the actual substrate layers themselves. Then, six months after that, they've actually hatched, they've gone into the substrate layers, they provided your substrate is good enough with good leaf litter and good wood content, your grubs are gonna grow up to be nice and strong. When they get to about that sort of size, they're then good enough to feed off to your animals. You will see them scurrying around the outside. I mean, there's one just there. We can see it just there. There's a few in there. I mean, there you go. There's another one. We've got a fair few in this substrate layer, so to be fair, it could do with being a little bit deeper. But fruit beetle grubs take around about a year from you first buying your first tub of grubs to being able to produce grubs off them. The only way that you need to... The only thing you really need to do is get your setup correct and spray it down once a day. Just keep the substrate layers nice and moist. Keep the humidity levels up. Give them a bit of surface area to climb on and you don't really need to do anything else you don't need to feed them because they feed off any dead beetles that are in there and the wood matter that's in the substrate so you don't physically need to do anything you can just set up a nice enclosure class it as a piece of art and leave it in the corner that's what i do that's some beetle grubs fruit beetle grubs let's move over to number four which this one may surprise you, is locusts. Here in the UK, we get locusts. I know you can't really do this in a lot of places, so I'm not going to dwell on this one too much. But locusts, the only reason they're in number four is because they need a little bit extra. They need a little bit of extra UV light. UV light has been proven to increase the product productivity of the eggs. They'll produce more eggs and better quality eggs. More live animals come out of this using UV light than would without UV lighting. They need a hot spot, so a hot spot, again, a heat bulb. If you've got a big enclosure like uh, that one just there, then you're going to need um, a hot spot, a heat source. Here, in this little exoterra just here, we it's only a 30 wide, 30 deep, and a 45 tall exoterra. It's nothing special because we're not breeding that many in here. But the UV light in here actually incorporates a bit of heat. Uh, quite a chunk of heat comes off it. It's the exoterra one. And um, it does create a nice little basking spot. So we didn't need to do that in here. You need to provide an absolute ton of surface area for them to actually walk around and climb on and all that sort of stuff. Granted, they just tend to hang around the UV an awful lot. Look at them, they're absolutely beautiful. You need to have a substrate layer that isn't too deep, that can retain a little bit of humidity but still stay quite dry. And you need an egg laying box. Now that egg laying box is just a sand soil mixture that's uh, slightly moist. Uh, just that tells the animals where to go and lay their eggs. It's quite amusing. We are seeing some actually get laid in this enclosure just here now this does cost quite a bit to set up an enclosure like this this was uh, it's an exoterra this is around about a hundred pounds worth of equipment just there but you can just set it up using whatever you want years ago i used this enclosure just here that was totally free i used a three pound heat bulb and i picked up a second hand um bearded dragon uv light because it wasn't giving off as much uv but it was good enough to actually breed them so that worked perfectly fine for them 
So try and make it as cheap as possible for yourself because the whole idea of actually breeding Laifu is to make it cheap for yourself. They again take, they take around about four months from adult locusts to producing locusts. So the babies, so once they've incubated the eggs and all that sort of stuff, it takes around about four months and it takes around about six months till I can get adult locusts back off them uh, to be able to feed to my bearded dragon, Diego. Food wise, they've got a little bit of rabbit food in there. They've got fresh vegetables and fruit. That does them perfectly fine. And uh, again, it's just scrap food that I have lying around, making it as cheap as physically possible to go in there. The only way it's on number four is because it needs UV lighting. Number three on the list is superworms. Now, I used to breed an awful lot of superworms, and I've done so much content on this channel to do with how to breed superworms. If you want to go through a playlist on how to physically breed all these live foods in detail, I've done a complete playlist. Feel free to just click on it, go through and see whatever you want to take your fancy and see which one takes your fancy and go into deep with that. We've done loads and loads of videos on each individual one, how to set them up, how to set them up cheaper, how to breed them, how to breed them, for loads and loads of content. If you want to see that playlist, I'll link it directly up there right now. But superworms are number three on the list. Why are they number three on the list? Because they just take a lot more work. You need to get some little deli cups with lids. You need to separate all of the individual superworms into each of these deli cups close the lids down, make sure they've got air but no food, and stack up loads of them up. However many beetles you want, stack double that amount because you're going to get some dead loss. Stick them in a really, really dark place. They can't see each other. That's the only way that they pupate into a cocoon. Once that cocoon, or pupa, as we call it in the trade, um, about takes, I don't know, four weeks for them to turn into the pupa, then it takes about three weeks for them to turn from the pupa to a beetle, then about another week until they become sexually mature, then they start laying eggs, and the egg laying is phenomenal. They lay so many, it's unreal. The setup for the beetles, I just stick about that much oats in the bottom of a container. I then stick a little bit of sawdust on the top. That's just a new little thing that I'm trying now. And the reason I'm trying that is because the eggs will get laid into the sawdust, and they'll just sort of slowly, as they're vibrating and walking around on the top, go into the substrate layers, the oats, and the beetles can't physically get to them to eat them. It's just a little something I'm playing around with, thanks to the guys at Reptile Systems for that little tip that they do, and it seems to be working perfectly fine. It just takes a lot of work to be able to get a beetle, to be able to breed the beetle. Word of warning, the beetles do fly as well. It's only rarely, but I had a little setup right in that back corner there, because it was nice and dark, and I'm constantly still right now finding the beetles absolutely everywhere, and I haven't bred them for around about six months. God help me when I try and uh, get rid of this place. <laughs> But again, it takes around about six to eight months from getting a beetle to being able to get an adult-sized superworm to be able to feed to your bearded dragon. Number two on the list, can you guess what number two is? It's mealworms. Now, why is that number two on the list? Quite simply because it's easy. Everybody overcomplicates it. You see so many self-cleaning setup videos, and the easiest way you could possibly breed your own mealworms is quite simply that much uh, oats in the bottom of a container. You don't need a lid. And chuck your mealworms in that's it that's all you need to do every week or so if you've got like a potato peel in or a banana peel just chuck it in with them and they'll climb on and they'll eat it and stuff like that that's the way i've been doing it and it seems to be working really well for me i've literally just got the container put some oats in the bottom and just some surface area for them to walk around on and just left them in there that's it i mean i put some food in there yesterday and i just leave it Every now and then, if I want to get um, mealworms to feed to one of the animals or to give to some of the carnivorous plants that I've got, I'll just pull it out and just pick one or two. The downside to this is when it comes down to the stage that I've got it at now where it's been set up for about a year now and I've not put any more oats in it, the dust can get up your nose. It can cause some allergetic sorts of symptoms. So runny nose, puffy eyes, sneezing all the time. So just be careful if you're in there rummaging around for mealworms and stuff like that. It there are better ways of breeding it, self-cleaning setups, mesh bottom setups so the eggs fall through the mesh. Uh, the easiest way, I, I like to do everything easy, that's the easiest way. It cost me nothing, it took about two months to get from a mealworm to being able to get more mealworms to actually feed after some of the animals. So it's quick, it's easy, it's cheap and it's time. It, does, it doesn't take any time. It's very productive, that's how you do mealworms. They are absolutely amazing but what's number one? Number one on the list is dubia roaches. I'm not going to dwell on this too much because I have done an awful lot of how to breed dubia roach videos. But we literally have this container just here. It's a tall container. It's dark inside. We have got the, you can see all the cable and the thermostat and stuff. That all goes down to one side of the enclosure. So the downside to breeding 
do be a roach is you do need heat and a thermostat but that just keeps it at a nice temperature if you've got a really warm room stick it high up in the room because heat rises that might work perfectly fine we stuck some egg crates inside there just for, to give them a surface area make it a little bit darker they can hide in between and uh, we chuck in loads of fruit and vegetables and they devour it through the night and it's productive it works we chucked in 50 doobia roaches you want to go from sort of five females to one male if you do get two males as the process continues and you do start breeding loads just feed your males off to some of the animals that's what i do my savannah monitor absolutely loves doobia roaches so it's cheap to set up it's zero maintenance because you literally just have to chuck in a bit of food once a week that's it um, and that's it Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you have enjoyed the video, make sure you hit the thumbs up button. If you are new around here, make sure you do hit that subscribe button.